this. There we go. It's been a while since I played that, but I can play it. So, so you think you get, you know, if my boss found out I was doing this, who knows? <laughs> What did you do today? I sang Pink Floyd on Twitch. <laughs> yeah, definitely got enough errors that YouTube's not gonna flag that. <laughs> All right, I just lost six viewers. <laughs> So it's close enough. It's close enough. Let's talk about catastrophic forgetting. Set my whiteboard. I guess we can do the whiteboard. I had some other things on here, but I think I can remove them now. Yeah. So the topic today is is sort of in the AI machine learning realm. So, so this is in the context of machine learning, not neuroscience, I would say. So, and the topic is catastrophic forgetting, or as Wikipedia tells me, it can also be called catastrophic interference, which I haven't heard before, but it's the tendency of an artificial neural network. And when they say, this is always defined as saying that it applies to artificial neural networks. I would dispute that it's not all artificial neural networks that are prone to catastrophic forgetting. They're talking about deep learning networks, uh, anything based upon the, um, what would we call it, the point neuron that's doing primarily spatial pattern recognition and classification is susceptible to this idea of catastrophic forgetting. Because let's look, let's look at, um, I always like to look at this, where did it go? There it is, the neural network zoo. <laughs> so this is a, a great graphic and, and these are sort of like, all the different architectures that you can build, lots of different architectures, you can build even more than this, but this is like, these are like design patterns or um, programming patterns, of, of ways that you can put together artificial neural networks. And this is all very focused on deep learning. I call this deep learning. Yeah, it's a great diagram, isn't it? Um, so you can really sort of understand how a lot of these different ideas are structured. Uh, convolutional neural networks. Here's a deep convolutional neural network. Oops, wrong one. Hello. There it is. <laughs> this guy. And you can, you have to imagine having lots and lots of layers. Like you can, you can sort of take any node in here between the input and the output and expand on it, you know, and just, and let's like do that process. Let's, whatever that is doing over and over and over again. And that's what a lot of what the convolution convolutional layers are doing. They're sort of tweaking the data in different, in, in different places on the way through. And you can do that a little or you can do it a lot. Um, but what you end up with on the right side here, um, Mark says he sees the, the round ones as the hypothalamic clusters. They're all round. Oh, those were oh, the hot field networks, right? The Markov, Markov chains. Interesting. I'll have to think about that. I know, I'm, I'm, I, I heard you mention something about a Hotfield network and, or a Boltzmann machine, I can't remember. Um, that would be a good topic for one of these AI chats uh, in the future. I'm gonna write that down. Because I'd love to really understand a, a, the Boltzmann machine or Hotfield network. And I know it's not too uh, hard. All right, I wrote that down. Okay, anyway, um, <clears throat> Mark says yes, so I'm waiting for a blurb of text. Um, yes, comma. Uh, anyway, what these end up with when you, when you get, when the information is passed all the way to the right is, you know, for an input, once this network is learned, because the, the model is in the weights between all of these nodes, and once that has learned, 
um, it has a representation of the of some some input space here, you know, that has been learned up over time in in all of these connections, so that when you give it a new input, it will classify it, and a certain certain bits will activate as an output, you know. Um, so the problem with catastrophic forgetting is. Let's look at the, the, def, the Wikipedia definition and then expand upon that. So it's a tendency of an ANN like this to completely and abruptly forget previously learned information upon learning new information. So, um, so we have to talk about learning and in these networks we do learning by the back propagation, um, uh, application of back propagation of error, you know, through, and you do that um, in like batches, right? You'll, you'll, you'll pass, you'll um, basically like average a bunch of stuff, a bunch of input together and process them all at the same time and then um, run back propagation of error across the whole structure um, and adjust the weights. Is it still working? Yeah. Um, so because you're sort of learning in batches, um, that means that your, your batches might have certain characteristics. Um, so you might learn patterns in one batch, and, uh, but, but then as you go to another batch, perhaps there's some subtle differences in, in the data or the characteristics of the data. And as you essentially apply the back propagation of error across the network, then you essentially wipe out knowledge of the past patterns. Um, and I'm sure that there's lots of, as I say, knobs you can twist and settings that you can change and stuff to either make learning stronger or weaker, you know, uh, uh, that will affect this. But there's also techniques, like here is the DeepMind paper, I think this was a big paper, uh, about overcoming catastrophic forgetting in neural networks from 2015, 16? 16, I think. Oh, 17. Um, so they're, they're basically laying out the problem here um, that neural networks aren't generally capable of learning tasks in a sequential fashion. So that's a good point, a good thing to point out right off the bat. The ability to learn tasks in a sequential fashion is crucial to the development of artificial intelligence. I would absolutely agree to that. Um, and that, so I have to point out here, this is the big difference between HTM and, and deep learning. HTM always learns in sequential fashion. That's what it like does. That's what evolution made it do. So we're, tr we're trying to reverse engineer how we understand the sequence memory, the sequential part of this is done in the brain. We, I think that we have a good understanding of that. That's what HTM theory is all about. Um, so, Right off the bat, you can see that the, the, the whole problem of catastrophic forgetting doesn't really quite apply to the biological idea of intelligence as we define intelligence, right? Um, so neural networks, however, are, are not capable of, of hand, or have not been up until this point. And then this paper goes in to uh, showing a a way you can, or an algorithm that you can apply to your deep learning networks called elastic weight um, consolidation. And I don't, I didn't, I don't know exactly what, uh, I don't understand the math here, but, but it's a way that you can try and counter that uh, catastrophic forgetting happens naturally in deep learning networks um, so that you won't catastrophically forget something that was important in one of the previous batches. Uh, so there's already methods in place for deep learning networks so that you can prevent this from happening. Um, the, uh, and this is probably the major paper you should read if you want to learn about that. Uh, oh, there's a summary I think I wanted to hit on here. Um, so yeah, so basically this paper is a novel algorithm to address that problem specifically in deep learning networks. Um, so now let's, let's talk about 
HTM and catastrophic forgetting because this question came up uh, on the forum 17 days ago. And someone asked, is temporal memory prone to catastrophic forgetting? Um, so that's a good question. I don't know why I didn't like it. But um, uh, the short answer is uh, that there's no, it's not. Uh, I mean, it, yeah, it can be affected by catastrophic forgetting just like any other biological system, but I wouldn't call it catastrophic, right? I mean, people forget. Yeah, it could, could be, a, there is a bit of a terminology issue. Biological things forget all the time, but it's not a catastrophic thing. It's not like you forgot everything you learned the day previous, um, at every new day. Uh, but I think that there's, what Mark pointed, pointed out here uh, is that, um, we don't call it out that, but the but the properties of sparse distributed representations are very uh, resilient to what causes I think this catastrophic forgetting, or at least the the idea that when you learn something new and it's like something you learned in the past, um, you don't lose that. You don't you don't lose that uh, that link that association, right? Hey, Falco. Um, so like, it's, it's almost like, uh, when you think about sparse distributed representations and, um, the overlap between sparse distributed representations. So you can do this type of matching with representations the way the brain represents information. You can do this type of matching so that if something you learn something and it's like something that you learned before, you don't lose that so I mean you build on what you have learned so there's this the idea of catastrophic forgetting doesn't in the way that it's described in deep learning in deep learning uh, doesn't apply I think and, and as you accumulate knowledge over time you know accumulate information about reality over time you're not just going to catastrophically forget that unless some mechanism of the distribution suddenly drops out you know and even then as long as the representation is distributed, it may not even affect you even then very much, except it may be a general performance degradation. Um, oh, really? I didn't know that. So I, I didn't realize I was hosting another channel. That's a good point. <laughs> Let me uh, unhost my channel. I was I, previously, yeah, I am. I'm hosting. Or no, I'm not. Read and host. Am I, I'm not, I guess I should have done it beforehand. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. So uh, I think I was hosting a channel. So whoever was watching that channel didn't get a notification that I was, um, had started streaming again. So sorry about that. Um, so I was talking about SDRs and so as Mark points out here, there's, <laughs> there's a couple of orthogonal associations to catastrophic forgetting, I think, when we talk in our papers about sparse distributed representations, particularly about unions and matching, which makes sense, right? Um, and then, what did you also say, G, down here, section G? Yeah, the union property. Um, because it's, because the way, because we learn the semantic structure of the world, um, we're just less prone to, uh, catastrophic forgetting. <clears throat> um, so I, I, I've already read this, but I like, I, I like this discussion because I think Paul's saying um, he hasn't experienced like the catastrophic forgetting of it, but, the, but there is certainly a capacity, right? For any, he says, for any given network, which is true. Um, yeah, Mark says, yeah, we've got we've got a sort of mathematical proof that our representation system itself is sort of resilient to um, catastrophic forgetting. So it's not it's yeah, but it's not it, it's the way that the that the whole system builds up a, mo a model over a representations over time. And, and it's very different than than I think the machine learning when you think about this. Um, it's hard to compare these diagrams 
to like an HTM structure because we have to talk about three dimensionals, three dimensional, well, not really, we don't need to talk about three dimensions, but it makes sense to think about a layer of cells that aren't just sort of one dimensional, like these are, uh, like this, this being, they call this, we call this one layer and this is one unit, right, of a layer. And we would build a, a structure for the spatial pooler to operate within that's like so many cells tall, that's how many cells would be in a mini column, and then how many mini columns are in the space. And then, and then if there's topology to the data, then you apply the topology to the structure of the cells too, and, and, and you have to create these topological neighborhoods. Uh, and that's, I, I don't, and that doesn't happen, I don't, I don't think, in these, in these networks. There's, you could say, um, convolution attempts to do that, in, the, in, a, in that it will take a picture and break it up, take an image and break it up in, into parts and, and have dedicated layers with units that are processing features in each one of those and then, you know, filter them up through a bunch of convolving layers that um, try and capture those groups and groups of features. Uh, but it's not the same, it's not the same thing as what we were talking about in spatial pooling. Although it, I think, you know, the, the idea of mini columns, I think is, is maybe an originator. Well, I think this, the convolutional neural networks were, came from the Hubel and Weissel stuff, most likely. Um, does the fact that deep learning is on learning in batches and HDM is continuous learning has an influence? Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The, uh, the batch thing is super important because uh, I think you, I did talk about this a little before, before you joined probably, um, that um, you, ha you have to apply the back propagation of error algorithm sort of all at once across the whole network. So you, you have to uh, sort of stop the system and, and do this big expensive calculation. So you end up training on lots and lots and lots of spatial inputs not necessarily temporal at all, just just a whole bunch of spatial inputs that represent the same space, right? A different, um, a, a represent, yeah, represent the same window to reality, whatever you want to call it. Um, and um, there is no sense of time there. It's not that the one of those images has any relation in time to any of the others, um, but you put them all in the same batch and you process them all at once. And when you apply the back propagation of error algorithm, then you update all your weights for, and they're sort of tuned to things in that data that it's trying to uh, minimize error for, classification usually. Um, now that batch might have different characteristics than the next batch. So when the next batch comes, maybe there's a subtle difference in the type of camera used or you know the types of lighting or angles, I don't know. The next batch comes and there's subtle differences in it, but you basically do the same thing. You process all at once, and then you apply the backpropagation of error algorithm, trying to mitigate the loss for these loss functions, and that sort of tunes again all of the weights in the network to perform best for the epoch of data that you just processed, which could remove the, the patterns from the last epoch and sort of overwrite them because the learning is newer and it's stronger. I think that's a good definition of catastrophic forgetting, which I, if you, <laughs> I, I think I described that better this time than I did the first time. So thanks for asking for another explanation. Um, does that match with what you think? Because I know you've done some machine learning, Falco. Um, uh, extract the central tendencies of the training data to learn the hyperplanes for the training set. You're, you're talking, this is like, you went a little bit over my head, but I think I know what you're saying. The central tendencies of the training data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you're overfitting in a way, right? Could you call catastrophic forgetting sort of um, orthogonal to overfitting? Because you could say that every time you apply the back propagation of error, you're overfitting to whatever data signature you're getting or sent the central tendencies of the data. Um, you could say you're, you're potentially overfitting for that. Um, and underfitting for whatever you've previously learned at that point. I, w I don't know if underfitting is a term, but I think I know what you're saying. 
Yeah. High dimensional fitting. Yeah. It's hard to think about the higher dimensions of data, but yeah, you have to think about what do you call hyperplanes, right? There's so many, um, there's so many, I don't know. <laughs> there's so many dimensions. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the right, I think that's the right way to put it. The, the new set is like fitting to, well, you're, create, you're creating the new curves to that data, right? Every time you, apply a backpropagation of error algorithm across a machine learning network, you're, you're trying to mitigate, or you're trying to get uh, the best performance in your loss function. So you're trying to classify the best, basically, it's because it's almost always some type of classification task. Um, and uh, for each one of those loss functions, which is so each, uh, I'm trying to think, of, I'm trying to think in like Bayesian terms here, and I'm not very good at this. I'm, I'm not very good at the math um, behind this, so forgive me if I, if I stick to <clears throat> the more high level topics. Um, yeah, I, I guess that's, so that's a good way to put it though, Mark. Think of it as learning the skeleton of the data. What you're trying to get in one of these networks is you're trying to represent as much as possible about the data you're seeing um, in, in that network. And you're writing your loss functions in a, in a way that you can um, optimize for the types of assumptions that you're, or the type of inferences you want to make on that data. Um, but as the data changes over time, if the, each data has its own sort of shape, signature, whatever, each, each batch of data can be characterized in some way, most likely differently than another sort of batch of data. Um, even if there's all taken in the same way, you can't be guaranteed that when you give a machine learning network a new set of data that it won't um, change what it already knows as it applies learning for the new data. That's the whole idea of catastrophic forgetting. I'm still just sort of defining catastrophic forgetting. but. <laughs> um, and, and the reason why it's not a big deal for biological systems is because we're continuously learning. Uh, one, of, one of the reasons is we're continuously learning. So there's not like um, every day we wake up or every night when you go to sleep, a back propagation of error algorithm applies through your brain. And uh, like there's an interesting process, I think, that happens when you're asleep for sure. But I don't think it's anything like that. Uh, but uh, but you can move on because every moment of every day you're you're learning right it's it's in a sequential fashion in the same way that you know I pointed out at the beginning of this paper we said the they said the ability to learn tasks in a sequential fashion is crucial to the development of artificial intelligence that's the type of sequential learning we do every day how we learn tasks in a sequential fashion um, so it's like, it's not necessarily applicable to the type of intelligence that we are trying to model with biologically inspired intelligence. Um, Mark says it's equally important to define what it is that deep learning does. Learning a new, sh a new shape is at cross purposes of what you learned in the old data. Um, yeah, you, I, I think that most people are doing, I, I don't know, but it seems if I were doing a lot of machine learning stuff, you, you, I would ha have a tendency to assume that um, whatever data I trained on, I was going to get that basic type of data in the in the real world, in the production world. And I know from experience, after like living in the real world of data and big data, streaming data, that data changes over time. It changes over time, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's and it's not the data types or, or the stream definitions necessarily. It's the characteristics of the data, and everything changes everything changes over time. So you're not gonna have a general intelligence algorithm that can't handle changing over time. The world, reality, changing over time. You have to change with it. The intelligent system has to change with the world as it evolves, because it will continue to. Um, so learning has to be completely orthogonal or it will interfere, and it's almost never so. 
That's a yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, and and you should be able to. Um, we we do this all the time. We, do, we turn learning on and off, on or off. The the whole, the part that where your brain's learning is sort of, perhaps the, the simplest part. It's just allowing, um, synaptic permanences or weights to be updated in response to correct predictions or incorrect predictions. Um, if you can easily just say, just turn that off and, and explain intelligence without that. And, but you have to, but learning has to exist for you to be intelligent for you to learn anything at all. Right? So once you have learned something and once any of these intelligent systems that we create has, has learned to do something or to perform in some way to do something, you should be able to just turn learning off and let it go, do its thing. And it'll never learn anything new. And as long as the world doesn't change, and perhaps for lots of robots or intelligent agent systems or whatever, they'll be deployed in worlds that never change, perhaps that's so. Then they can go about their business and, and never update their model of the world and just continue to do what they do. And that's all we need them to do. But for real living things, we never turn learning off unless there is a biological problem. Um, and I think for most intelligent systems that we end up creating, we will not be turning learning off. Uh, I think that would, that's like a key feature is being able to learn. Even after you've trained something to do something, um, you sh it should still be able to learn to change its representation of reality as reality changes in front of it. Um, Falco says that data changes and the system should too, right? Does ring home if you consider that the mammal's brains are tuned for adaption. That's our edge over the dinos. Um, there is no context in deep learning networks to allow linear separability of the training sets. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a very mathy way to put it, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the H of HTM will add context. Yeah. Or, or as well as lateral connections, the thousand brains idea that also adds context. You, you don't have to have H. I don't think, I think, you can do a lot without H. Let me put it that way. You can do a lot without hierarchy. Um, with, I think, the lateral connections, you could, there's more than we think you can do. Locally. <laughs> Locally, yes. <laughs> but it's a good point to point out. A lot more is happening locally, I think, than, than most neuroscientists and especially machine learning scientists think. Um, in, in, an, in, an, in a neural network, in, the, in, a, in a neural network in your brain anyway. There's a, there's a lot of more smarts locally than uh, it seems. Because we're just talking about these little cortical processing units, right? Well, it, group them into neighborhoods and they become much more than the sum of their parts, right? which, is, which is a good way to put your brain. It's much more than the sum of its parts. The, the lateral connections that we describe in our papers, in the columns paper, the columns plus paper, are, are not part of the hierarchy. Um, the hierarchy would be the output of a cortical column, like the, the um, feed forward output, right? And, and, that, and the same thing, a column getting feed forward input, it would be getting feed forward input, not from sensor data, but from somewhere else in the cortex. That's, that's the hierarchy part. The lateral stuff all happens within one layer, wherever that cortical column happens to be, even if it's, I don't want to say that, but let's just say wherever it happens to be, <laughs> it, it's going to share laterally uh, through, the, through those lateral connections with neighboring mini columns. No, um, neighboring cortical columns. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, you know, I'm sorry, I forgot to turn Discord on. I gotta get a checklist or something. <laughs> uh, hopefully this works. Um, if anybody wanted to join the chat, I know there's only a few of you online, but if anybody wants to join chat, uh, voice chat while we're on, here is the link. And I just turned uh, Discord voice chat on, so you can jump in there if you want to voice chat with me, anyone else who joins in. Um, we're talking about catastrophic forgetting um, and I've been talking about it for about a half an hour, uh, and looking for any, does anyone have any, uh, direct experience with, with it at all, um, in, in the deep learning systems that they have created? 
Just curious. Because <clears throat> it's, like I said, it's not something we worry too much about in the, in the biological area and HTM. It doesn't, it doesn't affect HTM systems uh, because of their um, natural sequential nature of processing input. Okay. Okay. Well, nice chat, everybody. I'm I'm going to close the show. I don't, I'm not just going to drag it out for an hour. If uh, the topic is over, the topic is over. So I appreciate you guys hanging out with me for a while, talking about uh, artificial intelligence, specifically deep learning and catastrophic forgetting, and whether catastrophic forgetting applies to biologically inspired intelligent systems. I don't think it does. So uh, take care and um, have a wonderful Monday. I might be streaming tomorrow. I'm writing a blog post about my experience with Twitch for Nementa.com and I might stream the writing of the blog post. <laughs> we'll see, why not? <laughs>